One of the things I've realized is that there's so many chemicals in laundry detergent and the soaps out there. So I either make it myself, it's actually pretty easy, or I use my green fills. If you go to chantelrayway.com soap, I'll give you my free recipe for laundry soap. Or if you just feel like buying one that's really clean and not filled with tons of chemicals, you can get it there. chantelrayway.com soap. Hey guys, I'm on my way home from being on national TV talking about intermittent fasting and I'm answering the question, does intermittent fasting help you lose weight? Maybe you guys have tried intermittent fasting and lost some weight, but now you might just be stuck in a rut where you're not losing as much as you want. Well, I've interviewed over a thousand thin eaters and I've learned that intermittent fasting is just one of the tools they use, but there's so many more. There's nine other principles that they use to stay thin. To get out of your rut, click here to watch this free video. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And today I have Jerry Texera, and he has a website called bodyweightstrength.fit. And our title today is how to blend fasting with muscle, massive muscle building, even eating in a four to eight hour window. And so this is great because I love when we have guys who like you are ripped and have massive muscle and say, look, I can do this while I'm eating in a four hour window or eating one meal a day or eating in an eight hour window because most people who are real big bodybuilders, I have a trainer, his name is Craig and he is big advocate into eating every three hours, you know, starting at 6 a.m. until 8 a.m. and eating small meals every couple hours. And so we're always, you know, kind of butting heads in that realm. And so I love when we have a guy that's ripped and chiseled as much as you are, who says, look, I can, I can look this good and still eat one meal a day or four hours a day or eight hours. So welcome to the show, Jerry. First, before we get started, tell listeners a little bit about yourself. Okay. So I've got two kids and my daughter is, she just turned 14. She's a competitive gymnast and that sport requires a big time commitment from my wife and I. And then my little guy is going to turn five soon. And my wife travels for work. She works in the medical field and our schedules are, are somewhat hectic. And so um, for me, the reason it's bodyweightstrength.fit is I transitioned away from going to the gym five years ago when, we, when my wife, right before she had our son, um, just because in the time that it takes to drive to the gym and back and wait for equipment, I can get an entire training session done. And so partially it was just with kids and when life gets busy, I, we all have 24 hours in a day. And so people often say, well, if you say you don't have time, it's just an excuse because we all have the same time, which is true. But as a busy parent, there are lots of days where if it wasn't for me working out at home, I wouldn't do it at all. And so that's kind of the initial reason why I transitioned into a system that I could do at home. And then um, the reason that I focus primarily on strength training is because when you look at human longevity, which is now that I'm getting older, and I'm not saying I'm old, but now that I'm getting older and I have kids, that's more my focus above anything is making sure that the choices I make are optimizing my health and my chances to live a long, fruitful life. And strength training is strongly correlated to human longevity. In the blue zones among centenarians, it's actually just as strongly correlated as, as diet or any of the other things that they find. And I know a lot of people don't know how to strength train properly. And so my goal was basically to give a free resource that teaches you how to effectively strength train without equipment. So you don't have to buy weights. You don't have to have anything shipped to your house. Um, so that, that's pretty much where it came about. And then um, 10 years ago, I read a book called The Warrior Diet. And at that time, I was six meal a day gym guy type thing going on. And when I read The Warrior Diet, it, it wasn't true intermittent fasting when I read that, but it is grossly under eating during 20 hours and then having like a four hour eating window. So I started with that. It worked really well. And then just a few months after that, I started to read about the eight and the, the, the eight hour window versus the four hour window. And I expanded to eight and I dropped the little bit of food during the fasting window. So it was a true fast. And then from there over the years, I went 20 and four, I've done one meal a day. I've done eight hours and it, pretty much any kind of intermittent fast or time restricted eating setup you can imagine um, I, I've done inside of that, that, uh, inside of that, you know, 24 hour period. And that's awesome. So I'm getting ready to 
go on, we have our president's club trip where we take all of our top performers in our sales people. So we're going to have like 20 or 25 people come to this president's club trip and we're all going to Cabo and I'm going to be in a bikini. So I myself want to lose, you know, maybe five pounds, obviously all my clothes fit me well, but I, you know, when you're going on a trip like that, you want to really look toned and really looking good. So I decided to do one meal a day just for the next two weeks uh, for until we go on this trip. So for me, what would you suggest? So we have a lot of listeners out there. It's starting to become, you know, people are going on spring break. They're going on vacation. If someone came to you and said, look, you know, I've got two to three weeks and I want to kind of chisel down in those weeks, what kind of advice would you give that they would kind of do to keep, keep themselves chiseled? for the next couple of weeks? Um, okay, so exercise and physical activity can help you obviously build muscle, stimulate muscle growth, but they can also increase the amount of energy you expend. So they can help you lose weight. Where it can be a double-edged sword is that in certain people, exercise actually reduces appetite, but in some people, exercise increases appetite. And so if you're, and, and it's not because we're all bio-individual to a degree, it, it's not like one size fits all. So what I would say is you can always increase your activity level some. Um, and if you do that and you're not someone who overeats to compensate, then that can help you in the near term. Um, the thing you have to watch out for is people with very high activity levels for a time period, you lose weight more efficiently, but your body adapts. and so. That's one thing I always caution people is if you, you, your diet and the way you set up your eating is what's going to help you to stay lean for a lifetime, not so much your exercise, even though that can be a tool. Because if you start out and you're doing, for example, 30 minutes a day of exercise, at some point, the body will have adjusted various things and you're not going to get the same. You still get health benefit, but you're just not going to be losing weight or increasing fat loss the way you did at one time. So what, so what I would say is if you are not already exercising at a high level, it's safe to go ahead and add some additional physical activity to help you with, meet that goal. And then on the flip side of that, you can adjust the amount of dietary energy you eat so you can eat a little bit less. But what's really important there is not to reduce your protein intake. And in fact, maybe even increase your protein intake. And that would be because in, in every study I've ever seen and there may be something floating out there that I haven't seen. But when you look at the total body of, of evidence, when they compare diets head to head, a higher protein variant of whatever diets being compared always comes out ahead in terms of weight loss and fat loss. And so if you're going to eat less, whether you're you know, keto or fasting or whatever the case is, you want to be very careful that if you cut an additional meal out or you compress your eating window, that you don't eat less protein. You just eat less carbohydrate and fat. So you eat less dietary energy but you don't reduce your protein. So that, that would be the single most important piece um, would be to keep your protein intake adequate. And if it's not adequate, get it there. So, and you are very built. I mean, I can just tell that you've got a lot of muscle on your body. And so when you were doing just one meal a day, it sounds like that's what you were just really concerned about is yes, I'm only eating one meal a day. I'm able to keep this muscle that I have because of the amount of protein I'm eating. And I hear what I'm hearing you say is that as long as you're getting the right amount of protein, it doesn't matter if you're getting it, you know, in this many you know, smaller meals, you're still getting that protein in. So you're not losing muscle because your body still has that protein to eat off of. Is that, did I say that right? Yeah. yeah what happens is um, there, there's, you always got to look at what you're optimizing for. And most people are not. So if you look at a bodybuilder, they're optimizing. It's not even about health. I'm sure that most of them do care to a degree about their health, but they're trying to do everything possible to build more muscle at, at essentially any cost up until whatever point, maybe they're a natural bodybuilder. So they don't do any like, you know, pharmaceuticals. Some of them do extremely risky stuff right? because again, they're optimizing just for muscle growth. But for most people, your primary concern is, is general health and wellness. And then you also want to maybe build and maintain muscle. And the most important thing by far, when you look at research is your daily, basically your net protein balance, which is the total amount of protein you turn over in a day versus the amount that you eat in a day. 
And so even if you do one meal a day, if you consume enough protein in that one meal, then the body's very good at hanging on to what muscle you do have. And you will still build some additional muscle, even if you do no exercise. If you take the standard American diet, according to the CDC, is like less than 15% protein by calories. So if you take somebody eating 15% protein and put them to 25 or 30, they'll gain muscle and increase lean tissue without any physical activity to a degree. It's only going to happen a little bit, obviously. But just increasing your protein will help you build and maintain muscle, regardless of how you split it up. Once you start talking about optimal, so if, if somebody were to say, hey, I, I've gotten my goal weight, I'm not worried about burning fats necessarily anymore, now I really want to try to add some additional muscle mass, then opening up your eating window could be beneficial because some additional protein feedings will give you more instances of what's called protein synthesis, where the body is synthesizing new proteins. So it would be more optimal from a muscle building standpoint to eat you know, two or three times in, in say a six or eight hour window, or even a four hour window, one meal at the beginning and one meal at the end would technically be better. But in having said that you, you can still, if you like the way you feel, if you prefer one meal a day, you can still get results eating the single meal. So, so hopefully that makes sense. There's a little bit of nuance. It, the single meal may not be optimal, but you can certainly still do one meal and you can still build muscle and you can maintain muscle well on one meal a day. So that's kind of where it's at. Hey guys, one of the things that will take your weight loss to the next level is coaching. You can either work one-on-one -on -one with me or one of our certified private coaches. If you'd like, you can schedule your free call. It's a 10 minute strategy call just to see if coaching is gonna really take you to the next level. The other thing is listening to the audiobook. Listening to the audiobook and getting the video course that I've done, people are seeing dramatic results. If you just listen to the audiobook 30 minutes a day, over and over and over again, and get the video course. Go to ChantelRayway.com and check out the video course. You won't be sorry you did. Hey guys, I want to tell you about a great product that you absolutely cannot live without, and it's called Digest Aid. When you're stressed, you might not be able to produce as much stomach acid. And if you're eating a little more right now and you're stressed, you need help to digest your food. My Digest Aid that I created has enzymes that are capable of doing just that. It has both betaine HCL, not just HCL, but an enzyme pepsin that helps your body digest your food, which is really unique. And right now, all of our products are 30% off. Go to ChantelRayway.com, click on store and get yours for 30% off. Just use the promo code podcast. I don't know about you guys, but I've been doing a ton of cooking lately and I've been having so many new recipes. Go to ChantelRayway.com slash free recipes to get the best kale dressing recipe you'll ever have. The dairy-free artichoke dip that you will love for completely free. I also want to give you my entire free smoothie book that has the best smoothies. One of the things that can help you lose weight is just to replace one of your meals with an amazing smoothie. So if you're eating two meals, just make one of them a smoothie. You can get my free amazing recipe book at chantelrayway.com slash free recipe. And our protein shakes are amazing as well. And right now they're 30% off. Go to chantelrayway.com, click on store and use podcast for the 30% off your protein shake. So how much protein would you suggest? Let's say that someone is a 135 pound woman and how much protein would they need? And let's say you had a 210 pound man, how much protein would you suggest for that guy? Um, if you, so if you're looking at actual research, um, there's, there's a professor, Stu Phillips, so you can, you can, if anybody's interested in going to reading his research, but he's ex researched this extensively and it's 0.7 grams per pound is what you want to shoot for. And you can go higher than that. And there's not going to be, um, there either may be some additional benefit to muscle hypertrophy going a little higher than that, but it's on the law of diminishing returns. So once you hit that 0.7 grams per pound, anything above that is going to be less efficiently beneficial, if that makes sense. So that would be like kind of the, the base, the floor would be 0.7 per pound. And then from there, if you want to go a little higher, the times that going higher would be beneficial is there's, there's research on protein overfeeding. And so what they find is people who are trying to build muscle 
as long as they're hitting that, and this, this, another guy named Jose Antonio is a, a PhD. I think they used 0.8 in this particular instance, but above that, there wasn't much benefit for building muscle, but as protein went higher up to, I believe it was 1.2 grams per pound as the, as a percentage of your total food intake, fat loss was better than it was at the lower protein intake. So to try to make sure that's not confusing, if you're trying to lose weight, increasing your protein to one gram per pound of body weight, for example, it would likely yield better fat loss results than being at 0.7 or 0.8. But for muscle growth, 0.7, 0.8, um, there's not a big benefit going above that. You're better off to add more carbs or fats if that's like your primary goal. So if I wanted to gain some muscle, which I, I don't really try to, I mean, I'm happy where I'm at. I don't really train for that. I just train for strength and endurance these days. But if you wanted to gain muscle, I would say if you're hitting 0.7 or 0.8, you're good. Eat extra fat, eat extra carbs if you happen to eat carbs. But if you're saying, I want to lean out, like in your case, I want to go to Cabo, I want to lose some weight, at least temporarily increasing your protein. So more salmon, more steak, whatever your preferred protein sources are, that would be more beneficial from a weight loss perspective. And the reason is that protein has a higher thermic effect by a, by a little bit. I mean, it's not massive, but has a higher thermic effect meaning it costs your body more energy to metabolize the protein than it does carbs or fat. So maybe it's only to the order of like 80 calories a day worth of additional energy spent, but you can, the satiety on protein is generally high. So you can feel satiated. You're not as hungry if you eat additional protein. And then that little bit of, you know, extra energy expense digesting the protein at the end of a month, you're talking an extra pound, maybe a pound and a half, but you know, you do it for three or four months and all of a sudden you've got an extra four pounds of fat, which occupies a good amount of volume. So it may not sound like much, but increasing your protein intake can help you from a satiety standpoint, but also from a fat burning standpoint. So if it was at 0.7 grams per pound, someone who was 135 pounds, that would come out to about 94 grams of protein. And then if they wanted to do one gram, obviously that would be 135 grams of right. protein per day. If a guy was 210 pounds, if it was 0 0.7, that'd be 147 grams of protein. And if they were wanting one gram, that'd be 210 grams of protein. So that's a lot of protein. I mean, I, yeah. I would say, I don't know very many people who are probably eating that much protein. So what would you say are if some really good protein sources that you would say, okay, here's some really good protein sources and how much protein is that taking? Is that giving you? So if you eat, um, a fattier cut of meat, all animal sources of food with the exception of some dairy is, is essentially going to be high protein. Um, if you look at like a sirloin steak, that would be a, a fairly lean cut of red meat. That would be somewhere in the neighborhood of seven grams of protein per single ounce. So you can, if you do something like sirloin or white fish would be salmon's also very high in protein, but you have some more fat per gram of protein. So per volume, a lot of white fish is high in protein, obviously chicken. M most meat products are going to range between five, if it's very fatty, to around seven grams of protein per ounce of meat if it's leaner. So if you're eating one meal a day, um, a 12-ounce sirloin steak, or maybe a, you might have to go a little bit bigger, but a good-sized sirloin steak could cover you for pretty much your entire day's protein for most women. So you can definitely get it in, um, but you'll just have to prioritize protein when you sit down so that if you start to get full, you're not leaving half of it, you know, on the plate. And then the more meals that you eat, the obviously the, the smaller protein feeding each time. So it, it gets to be a little less filling and maybe a little easier to accomplish if you have a, you know, for example, a four hour eating window, you could have half at the beginning and half at the end. And so then you're getting that, you know, if it's 12 ounces of sirloin, for example, or, or maybe it's 16 ounces for your body weight, you're doing two eight ounce servings, which isn't too bad. It's more manageable. So that, that was for me, the biggest obstacle with a one meal a day was just that I would have to eat an un somewhat uncomfortable amount of food where after I ate, I just wanted to go to sleep. Um, so that's just one of the considerations. And the fattier 
fr- from a satiety standpoint, for most people, the fattier the meat is, the more full you feel once you get to that point of, of feeling full, which is why I think a lot of people on a ketogenic diet are successful because you it mimics fasting. Fasting mimics a ketogenic diet in some ways. They're very similar, but you, you just are not very hungry. And so that's one of the things that I, I do run into. People will DM or ask questions. And oftentimes when they are eating keto, they're under consuming protein. And it's not often by a lot, but a lot of times there's an extra 20 or 30 grams of protein a day we need to get in. And whole foods always ideal because you're getting micronutrition in there that you're probably not getting in a protein supplement. But with that being said, there's nothing wrong with using a protein supplement. If you're already eating a, you know, a solid diet and you just look and say, man, I'm, I need another 25, 30 grams of protein a day. You can certainly do like a whey protein, or if you're plant-based, you can do a plant-based protein and that's fine. Um, either one of those types of things or Greek yogurt, you can buy Greek yogurt. That's very high in protein and is not, you know, overly filling. And so you can use something like that to help make up the difference versus just eating more of whatever it is that you eat. You can always use a protein supplement. And now let's talk about just on the weightlifting side of things. Let's say that someone is going to the gym. I know for me, let's just say chest press. So mm-hmm. let's say I'm you know, doing chest press. I'm doing the same weight over and over. What's some good ways to kind of continue to increase that weight that it's, you know, are you saying, you know, do more reps and, or are you saying, look, try to go a lot more weight and do less reps. What are you seeing that really helps build that muscle? Um, so there's, a there's a lot of different, you know, programs and different programming and all this stuff out, out there. And the, the, what, there's some principles that they call like granddaddy principles, which are like tried and true and are the most important element of a resistance training program or, um, an endurance training program. Really the kind of program doesn't matter so much, but the most important thing to, to remember whenever you are, are going to do an exercise program is the, the basically the tenant of progressive overload. And all that means is that humans are adaptive organisms. And the way that we force cellular adaptations is through external stress. And so what happens is if you do the same exercise, and let's just say like you're talking about, maybe it's a, a chest press or it's pushups and you do, let's say 10 and at, at number 10, either with your body weight on a pushup or at the gym with whatever weight you're using, you can't get past 10. So that's like as many repetitions as you can do at that weight. If you just do those same 10 chest presses or same 10 pushups every day, you'll get an initial adaptive response at the cellular level. So, you know, whatever, um, whatever increase you're going to get in cardiovascular fitness or in strength, you're going to get that. And once you achieve that, you're not going to adapt anymore. So if you did that same exact thing for the rest of your life, you will make zero additional progress. And so the really, really important thing to remember, and I've seen this before, like, well, you know, not that I don't go to the commercial gyms anymore, but I would see more often than times with women than men, but I would also see it with men is using a weight that is either not heavy enough for you or not doing enough repetitions with the lighter weight. What's pretty clear in research is you can stimulate hypertrophy, which is just the fancy word for, for muscle gain. You can stimulate the muscles to adapt to what you're doing. If you use a lightweight, as long as you perform enough reps to get you close to fatigue or close to momentary failure. So like if you're a woman and you want to curl like a 10 pound dumbbell, if it feels easy for you, then you're not getting anything out of that exercise. The, the repetitions you perform until it starts to get difficult are almost like nothing. And it's when you start to feel so like, what I always tell people is the tempo of the movement. If you pick up a weight, whatever it happens to be, and if you can move it pretty easily, you need to keep moving it until you can't move it easily anymore. And you have to think, Oh, wow, I've got to put some force on this thing. And then you actually have to try to move the weight. So if you train with a light weight, that's fine for stimulating hypertrophy, but you have to do enough repetitions to make it difficult for yourself. So with progressive overload, what, what you're trying to do is there's two main ways to make sure that you're continuing to overload. And it's from volume, which means more reps. At at its most basic, it's more reps. Or in the strength training world, they call it intensity, which just means at its most basic, more weight. 
So if you do those 10 chest presses and that's all you can get and you are trying and you can't get past 10 chest presses, then you probably need to add another two and a half pounds, for example. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can only do eight now or six, and then you keep working with that little bit more weight until you get it back up to 10. So as long as you're making progress in reps or you're making progress in weight, then you will continue to force your body to adapt to that additional stress. So that, that's, that's the most important thing that I think the average person has to know is that whatever you're doing, you have to make progress in weight or progress in reps, or your body will stop adapting. You'll stop building muscle. And so that's what you have to keep in mind, no matter what program or whose stuff you're following or whatever, as long as you remember progressive overload and you make sure you're doing that over time, that, that's the key to everything. Love it. Well, thank you so much for being on our show today. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Okay. So I have a site, it's bodyweightstrength.fit and that will direct you to, I have a YouTube, which is because exercise is very visual. That's where I post everything primarily. And I've got complete training sessions from beginner to intermediate to more advanced. And if you go to the YouTube and you click on, on the homepage for, for my channel, if you go down, there's an introductory video that will explain how the channel works. I don't have to do it here. But then if you go down, there's a playlist that says complete workouts and you can click there and then choose either beginner or the next one. And I'm adding new workouts. Try to add something new, at least monthly videos every week. But everything's organized by playlist and every exercise to include push-ups or squats. I start at absolute beginner for someone who's never exercised in their life. So we'll start with push-ups against the wall to help you build the base to be able to take your push-ups to the ground. So even if you've never exercised, if you don't know what the heck you're doing, if you're super self-conscious, I tried to structure the channel to take, I have people that are like, oh, my 70 year old mom finally started working <laughs> out. I hear stuff like that a lot. And the whole reason is because I started it with the absolute you graduate. beginning. You graduate. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And you so that, that's kind of where I started it. And then I have links on there to my social media pages. So people can just click and if Twitter or Instagram or whatever, if they care to follow those places, they can. Love it. Well, you guys stay tuned because we have another episode coming up in just a minute. And always remember, if you have a question that you want answered, go to questions at ChantelRayway.com. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>